Good morning, Web3. This is the Pyre Swap Show. How are you today? Good morning. Good morning, Zonic. Good morning, Johnny Crypt. We've got a very, very exciting stream for you today. Uh, phenomenal news. The fear and greed index is arguably 50% higher towards greed than it was yesterday. Uh, Alternative.me's fear and greed index was as low as 17 yesterday. Uh, this was, I guess, arguably the, the Great Depression uh, moment in crypto, if you will. Um, I find it interesting that fear and greed kind of lags recent events as opposed to, I guess, staying abreast of new ones. But the fact that you can rebound as much as 50% in a single day of fear and greed should arguably be a bit bullish, in just my humble opinion. I want to thank our sponsors, Pocket, for being PyreSwap's partners. Pocket, uh, the Pocket is a uh, proud sponsor of the PyreSwap show, along with the RPC provider for PyreSwap the DAP. Good morning, Dr. Mac. Good morning, Hustle. Good morning, Johnny Crypt. And we're not streaming to Discord. Yeah, no worries. Anyways, yes, good morning, everyone. Um, Additionally, there's some stuff that I want to talk about today, and the stuff that I want to keep talking about is real yield and why it's important. I want to talk about uh, also the threshing floor. This is called the Fivean threshing floor. Um, real yield being important is critical because it actually is going to be the driving force in the evolution of decentralized finance. Uh, in order for decentralized finance to really gain its footing and kind of mature and perhaps threaten the modern world of banking, there has to be fundamentally sound investment vehicles that are not just effectively pumping and dumping on the guy behind you. Um, real yield as well is, is very, very critical because it is, um, it is a type of yield that is not just based on endless stimul uh, stimulus. Um, you can look at, when you think about real yield versus fake yield, you can think about real yield being if you owned a piece of farmland and you were growing carrots, the amount of carrots that you're getting from this farm every year and that you sell for is the yield on the property, right? So if you have, you can own a rental property as well. If you own an apartment building and you rent it out to a tenant, the amount of money you're making annually as a percentage on the, on the cost of the property itself, that is your yield percentage and is a real yield. Um, the opposite of this would be a fake yield, meaning you're debasing the supply and then effectively the profit is senorage. The profit is senorage. Um, things that are kind of more like fake yield are kind of when you see uh, stimulus events. So during COVID, a lot of countries were doing stimulus cash giveaways, and this is actually fake yield. They were in fact just debasing their currency supply. We are arguably doing the same thing in our Genesis event and then just giving them out to people to kind of stimulate the economy. Uh, we do that as well for marketing purposes, but generally we look at it that taking the Keynesian approach, we are in fact going to stimulate our economy to the point of growth by attracting a new user base that we will retain. I hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, additionally, I want to talk a lot today about um, the creation of real value inside Web3 that isn't just related to capturing financial profit. and. I want to be clear that there's things that people pay for in Web3 with these actual crypto tokens that is, that is not exactly involved just pumping and dumping on the guy behind them. Um, it's really, really important to understand how to create economic value that isn't just tied to the price of a token, but rather tied to the price of its utility. And I will be doing some whiteboarding on that very soon. Uh, I want to take, this, take a moment to also address any new good mornings to address and see. We have some new ones. We have some old ones. Um, I, uh, I, I want to say good morning to everybody who is responding to me on Twitter as well. Good morning, James. Good morning, Zero Kex. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Good Project. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for, those of you, for those of you following on Twitter, we encourage you to join our Discord. Uh, you can, in fact, win cash prizes by attending the AVAX Talk Twitter space sponsored by PyroSwap, and you can win up to $30 of Pyre AVAX, which you can then learn active staking with. You can play with house money to learn active staking, the revolutionary new DeFi primitive brought to you exclusively by PyreSwap. So does anyone have any questions before I begin?
Fantastic. I do see some typing. Okay. So let me make sure I'm gonna I'm gonna wheel this whiteboard in and we're gonna compensate for glare if we have to. Let's make it look just like that. That's perfect. Yep, you can you can frame in. Fantastic. Shout out to this night figurine, which is really, I think, bringing together the foreground of our set. Uh, this night figurine, for those of you if you don't know, has been in my family for decades. Yes, it is a real night figurine from a European country that I visited when I was eight years old. Yep. And it has, uh, it was on a bookshelf for many years in my mother's house. And, uh, you know, I decided that I was going to make it part of the set for this show because of our uh, fantasy fiction theme. And now it has become a priceless collectible that, you know, without it, this show would not be made possible. So today I'm going to talk to you about some proprietary stuff because I want to talk specifically about the way value can be created in Web3. And if you guys can't see the marker on this whiteboard, please speak up. What looks like legibility to me might not be legibility to you. Uh, whether it's my handwriting being too skinny or being too sloppy, uh, I encourage you to communicate with me. And uh, I also encourage you to say GM in chat as well, or on Twitter. When I talk about a threshing floor, we're gonna call this fives threshing Floor. Now, I'm going to explain the title of this before we go any further. The first thing about this is that I always attribute myself. Uh, I don't do this out of like a sense of ego or a sense that like I need to make sure that I'm getting credit. Um, I need to name these concepts after myself because. There are a lot of narratives in DeFi and Web3. There are a lot of narratives in the DLT space that don't attribute their original um, author. They don't attribute their original author. And because of this, when these things fall to the wayside or, or are disproved or are perhaps um, reclassified in their importance or significance, they don't continue to look at the author of this concept. Um, we don't do things like that in the real world. For instance, there's two temperature scales that are used most commonly throughout the world. Examples would be Fahrenheit and Celsius. Now, if you guys aren't aware of this, Fahrenheit and Celsius were actual human beings. Fahrenheit, Daniel Fahrenheit and Nil Celsius. They were two guys uh, from which these scales were named after. It's important to keep the, the names of people on scales because the, the usefulness of these scales um, also accompanies the fact of the, the impact of the person who founded it. Uh, I'm not going to spend the rest of this Pyre Swap show talking about the difference between Daniel Fahrenheit and Nil Celsius, but uh, I will say this. Daniel Fahrenheit is the father of thermometry who has literally contributed more to thermometry by himself than all other contributors to thermometry since his time. And he lived uh, several centuries ago. Uh, Kelvin, I mean, that was uh, useful. I guess space travel and stuff like that, but yeah. Yeah, thank you to everybody asking about the Kelvin scale. Uh, yes, there's always somebody. Always somebody has to ask about Kelvin. Uh, yeah, and I mean, to, to compare against Celsius, Celsius didn't even work with temperature. He literally just thought about doing a zero to 100 scale, and when he first created it, 100 was the freezing point, and then zero was the boiling point. So literally somebody else flipped it around and be like, hey, why don't we make the hotter nut one the larger one? And they just reversed it and they still call it Celsius. And that's literally the entirety of his contribution to thermometry. Um, Daniel Fahrenheit invented the mercury thermometer. He, did, he invented other types of thermometers too. Uh, he was literally a contributing member of the Hansa League and he literally you know, solved weather forecasting problems for like, I don't know, what probably was billions of dollars of merchant travel through the North Sea and the Black Sea, not the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. Um, so I named this Phi's threshing floor. Uh, the reason being, there's lots of concepts in DeFi. Specifically, I'll name two of them. Minor extractable value, known as MEV, and the other one is impermanent loss. Neither one of these conce concepts attribute their original founders. And because of such, they don't take into account the impact of the concept's author. So 
For instance, in Impermanent Loss, if you guys aren't aware, Impermanent Loss was popularized by a dex known as Bancor. Do you, are you guys heard of Bancor? And by the way, can you guys read the whiteboard? Can you guys read it? I'm gonna actually spell out this, this project. B-A-N-C-O-R. Can you guys read that? Fantastic, fantastic. So Bancor started off as a DEX. It started off as an Ethereum DEX. And it raised over nine figures in venture capital. And it raised over nine, fi uh, nine figures in venture capital based over it claiming to solve a problem that other DEXs had. And that DEX was known as I.L. Who here can tell me what I.L. stands for? Can anyone tell me? Class? The professor is asking a question. Does anyone know what IL stands for? Goodness gracious. You know, uh, there's been some commentary that this time slot is not uh, bearing as much yield as other time slots. And uh, it might be the case that we change the time that we do the Wednesday stream, you guys. We might make it uh, something closer to the afternoon of North America. And um, yeah, more on that later. Thank you so much, Pyre Producer. Yes, impermanent loss. Yes, yes, zero kex. Pyre Producer got it correctly. Impermanent loss. And no, I didn't actually give him the answer, but he might have Googled it. Who knows? Anyways, Bancor claimed to solve impermanent loss. And what they were going to do is they were just going to issue their token to liquidity providers. Does that make sense? Literally, they were just going to give their, literally, they kind of invented the idea of the farm. Does that make sense? Like they were going to give out B, BNC or whatever their, I don't remember their, their token to effectively compensate for impermanent loss. However, they weren't able to actually solve this impermanent loss. And the, the fact of the matter is that their token crashed as well. Later on, they suffered an exploit where eight figures of capital was, was um, compromised. Bancor hardly even functions as a DEX anymore. I want to say they're not even in the top 50 dApps on Ethereum. And on top of the fact that they are not trading today at what they were trading uh, three years ago or even in their, uh, in their first year. They're trading at a lower, lower rate. Um, Bancor was the one that popularized this term. And because impermanent loss sounded scary and not many people understood it, it spread like wildfire. Additionally, you know who was spreading the meme and the ideology of impermanent loss? Centralized exchanges. Coinbase, Binance, you name it. Your favorite centralized exchange was literally posting tutorial videos about impermanent loss and its risks. Why do you think that centralized exchanges were posting videos that highlighted the risks of impermanent loss? Because they don't want decentralized exchanges competing with them. Does that make sense? So if impermanent loss is a risk, how come these gigantic centralized exchanges have zero problem being liquidity provided? Like nobody really thought that through. Like if you're literally looking on a DEX website and then their tutorial section, they have a video highlighting the risks of a permanent loss. Doesn't it sound crazy? That would be like going to a, uh, that would be like if you went to a military recruiting office or whatever, and like they were just telling you all the risks about joining the military. I don't know how to describe it. Like this, that's so, that's so ridiculous. Or like if you went to a restaurant and like on the menu, they just give you a warning, don't open your own restaurant. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's literally what it is. Like if you went to eat at a fucking restaurant and at the top of the menu, there was this, Hey, by the way, don't open your own restaurant. Opening your own restaurant has risks. And I don't think anybody else like conceptually connected this together. Bancor, it popularized this boogeyman called impermanent loss. And then it failed at its own job. Does that make sense? So when somebody does this, you should call into question the brain that popularized the idea. Does that make sense to you guys? Like if somebody creates a concept and they say that, that, Hey, my business model solves this problem. And then they even fail at doing their general job. You might want to call into question their analysis of the problem as well. Impermanent loss, which is also known as divergent loss or what I would call cross Lambda coefficient in adult finance. It is a real thing, but the fact of the matter is, is it can be mitigated and offset and even uh, eliminated completely. If you understand, the mechanisms of liquidity deployment. 
More on that later. That is a topic for another time, but I'm just explaining why I say that this is Phi's threshing floor. Because if God forbid one of my projects, possibly PyroSwap in the future, is proven to not work, which remains to be seen, so far it worked, then every single one of my underlying concepts should arguably be scrutinized, should it not? If Phi is gonna go around saying he's one of the best economists in all of Web3, and then his DAP has so much fun fundamental theoretics underlying it, if my DAP doesn't, isn't able to do what it, isn't able to do what it claims it does, then clearly my underlying concept should all be called into scrutiny. Nobody does this in Web3 because, by the way, can you zoom in on me? I want to I get some zoom in for dramatic effect here. Nobody in Web3 knows what they're talking about. Thanks. That's all I wanted. Yeah. We can turn that into a GIF later. <laughs> Man, thank you guys so much for hanging out here on this Wednesday morning. So when we talk about Phi's threshing floor, I'm going to literally explain to you how value is created by in fact dividing. We literally multiply value by dividing. This is kind of a, uh, this is kind of a difficult concept because when we create value, we're not creating it in the same lateral with which we're dividing. It's from us creating the option of two different things that we create new value, which is in fact the value of the choice. Does that make sense? If that doesn't make sense, I want you guys to consider a scenario. Consider an ice cream kiosk. We'll say an ice cream truck, actually, for people who might not understand what I'm talking about. And we'll talk about ice cream, ice cream truck. And then we'll say three of them. Number one offers vanilla. Number two offers chocolate. And number three offers vanilla and chocolate. So I want you guys to think about this and I want you guys to think about quantification in what the value that these three ice cream trucks provide. The value with which they provide. And this is something that is not really conceptually understood and I should honestly call this Five's ice cream trucks actually. Yeah, here, I'm just gonna write that down too. Five's ice cream trucks, okay? Truck one offers vanilla. Truck two offers chocolate. Truck three offers vanilla and or chocolate. So when we think about what are the values, meaning what can you exchange money for here at truck one? How many things can you offer? Like what does, what does truck one offer you? How many things does truck one offer you? Truck one offers one thing. Does that make sense? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at my other, my other chats. Truck one offers one thing. Truck two, it also offers one thing. What do you guys think truck three offers? Oh, wow, zero kicks, brilliant, brilliant. How did that happen? How did that happen? You know what, zero kegs, I'll tell you this. It can be argued that truck three offers four things. It can be argued that truck three offers four things. How is that possible? How is that possible? Is it possible that offer and value creation is exponential? How is that possible? Vanilla offers one thing. And what is that one thing? Yeah, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change the color of marker to, uh, let's see, something like this. Or maybe I'll do the dark blue. The one thing that truck one offers is vanilla. The one thing that truck two offers is chocolate. Truck three 
offers vanilla chocolate. Then it offers combination. Then it offers the option. So what I mean to say here is that not only can you in theory get both of the things, but you can also get either of the things as well. So if you're familiar with Boolean logic, you have the concept of and and or. Well, truck three has vanilla, it has chocolate, it has vanilla and chocolate, or it has vanilla or chocolate. These are four separate values that truck three offers that truck one and truck two do not. The choice, the fact that you could go to this truck and the fact that they would have options that increases the value of this truck in their user base's mind, in their consumer base's mind. Does that make sense? Like Baskin Robbins is a popular uh, American franchise for ice cream. And they're popular because of, again, they offer 31 flavors. If you're not familiar with Baskin Robbins, uh, I mean, you can look that up on your own. But the fact of the matter is, they marketed with the fact that they have 31 flavors because they were able to lure people in with options. The fact that people could try new things, could try new combinations, could experiment. These were all values that were added in the customer's mind by Baskin Robbins providing this amount of versatility in their business model. Does that make sense to everybody who understands Fi's ice cream trucks? Does that make sense? It's almost like this is exponential. It's almost like one squared equals one, two, well this is also one squared equals one, but two squared equals four. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Does anybody have any questions about Fi's ice cream trucks? I'm gonna erase it from the board. You do have questions? Sorry, there is a question. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why audio would not be coming through. Uh, I have not heard of any other audio problems. Yeah, and I believe it shows that we're good on Discord as well and the other, yeah, the other, the other platforms. Um, okay, I'm erasing five ice cream trucks. If nobody has any other questions. The reason I'm talking about Fi's ice cream trucks is because it is a uh, underlying concept that needs to be understood for Fi's threshing floor. Do you hear discord? You do not? Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, we have we have solved we have solved the Discord audio. Okay, in the future, in the future, if you guys become aware that we have an audio problem, it will be extremely appreciated if you could uh, let me know. Uh, I was under the impression we were we were clean on a uh, Anyways, so for Phi's threshing floor, I need you guys to understand that you can in fact create value by dividing, by rather giving people an option. Because when you give people options, you're in fact increasing their freedom. Does that make sense? People generally like to have freedom because they like to have control. So when we talk about Phi's threshing floor, I'm gonna talk about six different things that, you can be, that can be used to create non-zero sum value. And in order to start with this, I want you guys to understand what a threshing floor is. Who here can actually tell me what a threshing floor is? Teaching us how to cheat again? I do not know what uh, this gentleman refers to. Oh, goodness gracious. 
you know, when I really start getting passionate about teaching something, the, the time just blurs by. Yeah, thank you, Zonic. Yeah, I just noticed that myself. Um, I should probably get like a, I should probably get like an actual API for the Epoch system in my house so I can actually uh, like see that countdown. Yeah, right there, right in the header. I need it actually in my, in my eyeball. That's probably what I need, you know what I mean? I just need it like Neuralink right into my head. Um, okay, do a total of zero people know what a threshing floor is? Z okay, threshing floor was how they actually processed grain back before technology was a thing. So the way they would do this, in fact, they still actually do it in some places, um, literally for grain to be processed, you actually have to separate wheat from the chaff. Have you ever heard of that? You separate wheat from the chaff. And the way they do this is by literally stacking wheat up on a platform that they effectively let a, uh, they let animals like a donkey or ox literally uh, move around the column, dragging a sled behind them, dragging a weighted sled behind them. This weighted sled literally crushes the wheat grain. And what that does is it separates the, uh, the wheat from the chaff, which effectively is the chaff is what breaks apart from the, the grain. Chaff can really be used only for composting and maybe some animal feed. But as far as humans go, we can only really use wheat. So the fact of the matter is threshing is a, literally a process. Threshing is like a refinement process. And the fact of the matter is when you thresh, you're starting off with, I guess what you would call like the crop. And you're splitting it into chaff and I guess the actual grain, which I guess would probably be the bran. I, uh, I need to, I need to review my, um, I need to review my vocabulary for, uh, plant biology, but through the threshing floor, you are creating value because the chaff and the grain, once they are separated, they can now be purposed to be more effective than when they are combined. Does that make sense to everybody? Threshing is something that people have been doing for thousands of years. Any questions about that? Everyone still with me? Okay. So when we talk about Phi's threshing floor, we talk about things that where you can create divisions, where you can create divisions in Web3 to create non-zero sum value. Meaning you can create things that people want on blockchain that doesn't just involve buying and selling for a uh, direct financial profit, which arguably they're measuring in dollars. So five threshing floor, uh, there is a beginner version and an advanced version. And I will start with the beginner version and I will start with just what I consider uh, the six teeth, the six teeth of five threshing floor. I call them teeth because on a threshing sled, uh, it doesn't have a smooth, um, the, the sled doesn't have a, um, doesn't have a smooth underside. It has, it has these teeth, these kind of like these ridges that it creates them, which are used as pressure points to crush the crop, separating it into wheat and chaff. I'm going to write that up here as well. Six teeth. I'm going to put that in quotes. Can you guys read six teeth? Is that legible to you guys? Okay. For the six teeth, I'm going to actually draw six circles in, a, I guess, a hexagram type of configuration. Let me see. Is that visible? Yep, it's visible. Okay. So we have these six circles. Can everybody see these six circles? In fact, this arguably, this marker works better than the black marker as far as visibility goes. Everybody has good visibility. Um, I missed the game. I literally just missed it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I literally, once I actually go into professor mode, uh, literally, yeah, I, I, I cannot, I will literally just do this until I run out of steam or until I run everyone else out of steam. And there are people that will tell you that's hundred percent true. But uh, anyways, okay. The visibility on the six circles, I'm now going to label these circles and I might use, I might use this color for that. The first, the first one here at the top, Cardinally, which I think is always the easiest one to understand, 
is the time value of money. And I'm gonna write it like this, T-V-O-M. T-V-O-M, let me see, is that, let me verify that that's legible. Nah, I'm gonna make a different marker for this. And that green might not be a winner. Yeah, yeah, if I had a darker green, I don't know. Uh, let's see, this is a brown. Yeah, that one's not bad. Okay, T-V-O-M. Can everyone read T-V-O-M? Wow, yeah. Shout out to Wise of Cynical, who just broke 200,000 uh, for his Pyre Phantom position in the IWV and then got more than 1% yield just now in the last couple minutes. 1% in a few minutes with a gigantic bag, by the way. Thank you. Javery, it's okay. By the way, I appreciate that a lot, T. Debangwa. And for those of you bragging about how much yield you're making with active staking, we would love to see those screenshots posted on Twitter with the PyreSwap page tagged in the caption. We will retweet every single screenshot where you show off your, your real yield from active staking. Does anyone have any questions about that? If you want a free retweet from a 10,000 follower account, all you gotta do is post that screenshot and tag the PyreSwap account. Tita Bengua, you know what? There's always tomorrow. Yeah, exactly, Zonic. Exactly. Well, Zonic, I have great news for you. There's always Avalanche. You can always just play on Avalanche. Yep. Zonic, all you gotta do is play on Avalanche. That's where all the money's at right now. Yeah, all you gotta do is stop showing favoritism to other chains. If you play on Avalanche, easy money. Yeah, Zonic, and that whale is you. Like, I mean, stop pretending. Yeah, you've been investing in this project for 18 months. Yeah, there is no possible way that you're not like, you're pretending that why so cynical. Okay, I'm not even talking about this. Okay, everybody can read TVOM, yeah? Is that legible? For those of you not reading the Discord chat, we have a member named Zonic who is pretending that whales are bullying him, but he is in fact one of the oldest supporters of this project. So like, I, I refuse to believe that he is not in fact a whale, if that makes sense. I agree with that, Cynical. TVOM, everyone can read it? Okay, TVOM stands for time value of money. For those of you who don't understand the time value of money, it is the most basic principle involving borrowing and lending and the concept of interest as well. The time value of money is also extremely important in Web3 because people don't just want to effectively get rich with crypto, they want to get rich rapidly. Uh, it's not just the fact that you can 10x your money in crypto, it's the fact that you can 10x your money in under a week. Like that right there appeals to the most, I guess the most uh, serotonin and dopamine uh, gambler brain that you see kind of prevalent across the entire Web3 user base. It's the fact that the money can also come quick or slow. Um, there are other ways that you can also make tons of money, but the fact that crypto shows it off uh, much more than other um, industries uh, causes this to be a, uh, uh, I guess you could say, sought after utopian return. The time value of money is actually opposite. These six teeth are opposite each other on five threshing floor. The time value of money is also the money value of time. And the time value of money and the money value of time are two separate values that you can in fact split between each other to create non-zero sum value creation. One of the ways where you can benefit from the time value of money in DeFi is to be a liquidity provider. Because you can, in fact, make passive real yield by providing liquidity in the short term. When you provide liquidity in the short term, you do run the risk of experiencing impermanent loss. But the fact of the matter is, is that over time, impermanent loss, if you are in fact deployed between uh, coins that aren't garbage, uh, all losses are quote unquote all contractions or anything less than uh, the optimal yield will always be offset by what you make in swap fees. 
when you collect swap fees, you're actually collecting fees in two tokens, not just one. Uh, being in the impermanent loss, uh, being, being a liquidity provider puts you in the, uh, the perfect horizontal position, which actually is the one that seems to uh, benefit the most long term. Um, people who really figure their minds around being liquidity providers tend to do really, really well in Web3 as long as they're not being liquidity providers for trash tokens or trash projects. More on that later. So does everyone understand the time value of money and the money value of time? The money value of time is things like when you can pay for priority. Does that make sense? For those of you who maybe uh, uh, travel frequently by airplane, you can actually sign up for something called TSA PreCheck, which is kind of weird that it's a government service, and you can effectively cut the line when it comes to air travel. Does that make sense? Anytime you can pay to cut the line or you can pay to get faster service, that is in fact the money value of time. The time value of money applies to more like lending, but it also applies to being a liquidity provider. You're in the horizontal position where you end up letting random people use your money for liquidity. They trade, they win some, they lose some, but in the long run, you'll always be making more money back through swap fees. It requires, this position requires a higher degree of patience than the average Web3 user has, which is why you see the majority of people not understanding liquidity provision, especially due to the IL boogeyman. Anyways, does everyone understand time value of money and money value of time? Does anyone have any questions about these two teeth of five's threshing floor? So right here, this is two ways. This is two ways. This is two ways where value can be created in Web3. If you don't understand money value of time, understand that PyreSwap has an epoch system. And this epoch system arguably is something done there to actually create difficulty for the user base. This epoch system is not there to effectively cater to every whim of the user base. The epoch system is there to put everyone on a level playing field and kind of equalize things uh, to, kind of, to kind of create the scarcity for the opportunities involved with active staking as well as all of our upcoming mechanisms and, and mechanisms and utilities in later phases of pirate swap. Uh, you know what, Maddie? I think you could argue that that, that is the case. But at the same time, Maddie, um, I think that the, the IWV definitely appeals to this because anybody who doesn't want to stake for too long, they will love the IWV. Does that make sense? So Maddie, you have to think about passive staking and uh, passive staking, which is also kind of similar to LPing, um, it also involves leaving money kind of in a configuration for a long period of time for you to, in fact, make that money back. Uh, if, for instance, if you buy a piece of real estate and rent it out, this is also the time value of money because every month or year that you have it rented is paying off your mortgage. And in theory, the property of your house should also be going up anyway because that's what real estate tends to do. If that makes sense. So, Maddie. I want you to understand that the um, that these six teeth right here they don't necessarily apply just to Pyre Swap, but I'm actually identifying the way they can apply to Web3 and DeFi as a whole. And I know that these six circles look very much like the overview of opportunities diagram. If you guys are aware of the overview of opportunities diagram, uh, it does look like that same configuration, kind of like a snowflake, but it is not the same diagram. Oh, and by the way, I'm wearing my Good afternoon, Jerome Powell t-shirt. Do you guys see? Can you guys see that it's Jerome Powell? Do you guys see it says good afternoon? Okay. It is not, it is not the afternoon where I am today, but it will be eventually. So I am, I am wearing this t-shirt speculatively on the fact that there eventually will be afternoon and then, it's, and then it's phrasing will apply. Does that make sense? That's very DJ of me. I'm front running everybody else on the afternoon. Do you guys get it? I'm shifting paradigms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm making them ready for an afternoon Wednesday show. You know, the, the next shirt I have coming, Javery, is the pink Wojak t-shirt. More on that later. Yeah. I think that's a great shirt to wear on the, uh, the high fear days. Anyways, time value of money and money value of time. And what time, where are time we at now? Okay, we're good. Um, additionally, there's two other things 
Uh, there's actually, well, actually one other thing that I'm going to talk about because this one applies a lot to Pyre Swap. I'm going to actually look at that camera now. Okay. Camera two? I mean, you can freestyle, freestyle. Okay. I'm going to now label another one. And we're going to use this one here and we're going to call it IVOM. And we're going to call this N. Sorry. That's my bad. We're going to call this N V O I. Who here can take a guess at what NVOI stands for or IVOM stands for? Thanks, Javery. Have a great rest of your day. Oh, by the way, I should do another round of good mornings because I'm assuming my audience is bigger now. Good morning, Alessio. Good morning, Maddie. Good morning to everybody who's retweeting us on Twitter, by the way. That's very much appreciated. Uh, you know what? We have a decent viewing on Twitter today, actually. Yeah, a bit higher viewer count than we did yesterday in the, in the other time slot. Okay, so MBOI and IBOM. Can everybody take a guess? And by all means, feel free to reply your guess to the, uh, to the, to the Twitter thread below this post. You can also DM the page directly. Can anyone, anyone has a guess? I do like to kind of have some, I do like to kind of have some uh, information. Oh, wow, Zonic, it's almost like you've heard this before. Information. IBOM, we mean the information value of money. And then here we mean the money value of information. Uh, by money value information, I want you guys to understand something. Professor Fye's Elastic Supply Dashboard is a perfect example of the money value of information. And by the money value of information, I want you guys to understand, in order to get up-to-date data from the PPESD, it has to, it has to experience transpiration epoch transactions. Does that make sense? So there has to be somebody paying for the gas on PyreSwap or on the other websites where PPESD is implemented in order for the in order for the dashboard to be up to date. So that dashboard loses integrity if people are not willing to pay for the epoch transpiration transaction. Does that make sense? The money value of information because getting that information is not for free. That information is deluxe information, even if it's actually extremely affordable. Even if getting this information up to date costs less than a dollar a day, it is not free information. Does that make sense? And because it is not free information, it is arguably more valuable than free information. Have you ever heard that free advice is cheap advice? You ever heard that before? Fantastic. Information value of money. Now, who here can give me a good example of this? I bet you look at it every day. Who here can give me an example of where you can find the information value of money? In Web3, in Web3. Brilliant, price produce, uh, pirate producer. Brilliant, exactly that. What are, you, what are you watching when you look at sites like Dex Screener and Dex Tools? What are you guys watching? Like, what is what is like everything based based down to? You're looking at things like liquidity, volume, market cap, and don't forget price and price action. In fact, you're actually looking at money over time information when you look at a price chart. You're looking at change in money over time. All the candlesticks are really just intervals of time. And you're looking at the change of money over time and looking at a price chart. Yes, exactly, Maddie. Yet all of those things, Zonic, all those things, all those things, all of those data points is the information value of money. People look at a project, they look at the, the price chart, they look at the market cap, they look at the amount of liquidity. Does that make sense? Uh, do I believe that their analysis is often sound? Um, I look at a lot of products in Web3 and I think it's not. I think that a lot of stuff that people think are the right move are just extremely um, ridiculous standards to have for analysis, but I'm not here to judge other projects as much as try to improve fundamental analysis across Web3 as a whole. Does anyone have any questions about IBOM and MBOI? Does anyone have any questions? Does everybody understand MBOI and IBOM? If you think about it, you know, there's also, um, we'll talk about this in a second actually. 
I want to get some actual, uh, I'll give us literally 10 more seconds to see if somebody has a, a question or a comment. I'm surprised that you guys understand these so well, but I think that most of you guys that have been coming to the Pirate Swap show for weeks and or months have uh, slowly started to uh, grow the synapses in my brain that are now in yours. The more and more I talk about my ideas, I think I, uh, I think a lot of people really like the feeling they get in their brain when I teach this stuff. We have some typing going on in this channel. Now I'll wait. I hope everyone's having a great day today. Good morning. And of course, uh, the Pirate Swap Show is brought to you by the Pocket Network, P-O-K-T dot network, the best and fastest and greatest RPC service you can get throughout the entirety of Web3. Indeed, Maddie. Indeed. Okay, you guys ready for the, uh, the the number five and number six? These ones should be really easy to guess. Interesting. 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 TBOI and then IBOT. I've kind of already given away what these are, and you should, if you're, if you're like a good logical conclusion guy, you already know what these stand for. Does anybody want to tell us? Does anyone in class want to tell us what these stand for? Yep. Yeah. Information value of time, by the way. Of time. Not over, but of time. Exactly, Maddie. Yeah, OF. But yes, but yes. Time value of information. So when we talk about time value of information, I want you guys to consider the difference between watching a price chart update in real time or looking at the five year history. Does that make sense? Would you guys agree that price action from five years ago is not as actionable as price action in the last week? Would you guys agree that the more recent price action tends to be in your brain considered to be more valuable? Sometimes you can look at later history. Sometimes that does matter for sure. But generally speaking, information that's more recent tends to be more valuable because it's been looked at by less people. The, uh, the opportunities that this information can provide are not yet completely exploited and or saturated. Does that make sense to everyone? You're not wrong there, Maddie. but yes, it is psychological. Maddie, I want you to know, all value is psychological. All of this is psychological. Yeah, it is contained in the human brain. Value is not really something that... Um, you see uh, non-biological entities care about. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Oh, that's great, yeah. Look at look what we have now. We can now screen share the general chat. How amazing is that? You studied at the wrong uni? Uh, if it makes you feel better, I am a college dropout. I did not finish college at all. Yeah. Um, Anyways, time value of information. Do you guys understand that? By the way, if you understand the, uh, the concept of front running, would you guys understand, let's think about this. Let's think about how there are certain policymakers in certain first world countries that they trade the stock market and they trade the stock market based on information they may or may not know ahead of everyone else. Does it sound familiar? Are you guys seeing the breadcrumbs I'm leaving? Anybody? Has anybody ever heard of what I'm talking about? <gasps> Someone's dropping a name, but I would never be so petty as to uh, say it out loud. I'm definitely not in the bathroom in a mirror three times. How that goes? <laughs> yeah, okay. Information value of time though. What is that? For information value of time, 
what you want to look at is what you want to look at like change over time. Does that make sense? When you look at information value of time, you can look at how much, how fast things are moving. For instance, a lot of people, when they look at a price chart, they want to see not just the trend, but how frequently this trend has new data punched into it. Does that make sense? A chart with a lot of activity that's moving sideways is still more valuable than a chart with low activity that's moving sideways. Does that make sense? It's the amount of information you can get in an interval of time. Everyone understands that a candlestick is an interval of time, right? So if we're looking at a chart on the uh, 15 minute interval and every candlestick represents the open, ho open, high, low, and close in that 15 minutes, the more transactions you have in that 15 minutes, the more valuable that information is. Because the more things are happening, that particular window of time is giving you more information. Does everyone understand this? So the more information you can acquire in a short period of time is also a tooth of the Fizian threshing sword. I, um, I have no idea if Damian Webb is actually in this stream, but yes, the way to get a role is you already have it. So I, uh, I think you're good. Um, yeah, for those of you who uh, aren't aware, right now, because we are a sponsor of AVAX Talk, uh, you can in fact get up to $30 of Pyre AVAX just for completing uh, seven easy steps. Um, uh, we, we give this out to up to 15 people weekly. And this is done to... Uh, to uh, evolve you into understanding active staking. If somebody could point this individual towards the uh, AVAX Talk Prize channel, that would be much appreciated. Anyways, do you guys understand these six teeth? There's actually more and more. Uh, there's an advanced version which gets crazier. We start talking about things like entertainment value and control value and stuff, which are also things you can get inside Web3. Uh, an example of control value is like a governance token. Does that make sense to you guys? When you have a governance token, you have like a share of control. Does that make sense? Like voting rights as a control token. Uh, entertainment is like, you know, uh, GameFi or even just the idea that um, people watch certain YouTubers based not just on the information that they get in a period of time, but also the entertainment they get in a period of time. Does that make sense? So if you want to think about like who are the most successful YouTubers, they offer a lot of information value of time and entertainment value of time packaged into the same video. Does that make sense to you guys? You got to be a bit both. You got to be both educational and entertaining. Making sense? Uh, I'm not going to get the advanced version, but the, from these six teeth, I consider these the most underlying teeth. It's from combining these teeth that you get the other two things. Does that make sense? I'm not going to get into that, but there's more things that humans value. I wrote a uh, model about this and um, wherever these things can be split up, these are things in Web3 that you can build economies around whether they are micro economies or nano economies, you can build utilities around. Because once you can kind of derive things to time value of information and information value of time, it's only so many connections you can make until you get to money. Does that make sense? Because if you understand that information has value and you understand that time has value, if you, all you gotta do is go from here to here to get to money. Does that make sense? So this is effectively the way that you can design tokens that have things that would cause them to have price support. I hope that makes sense. But all you gotta do when you go from the time value of information is to go there to get the money. All you gotta do from go to the information value of time is to go here to get the money. Does that make sense? The way this looks is like MVOT and then you have the TBO. Like it looks, it's a, it, it looks kind of, well, I'm not gonna get into it, but I hope this makes sense. The time value of information, information value of time, and then we look at, um, yeah, how that makes sense. 
Like you can in fact create these economic systems where people are actually paying for things even if those things are just there to help them make more money. Does that make sense? Because if they're paying for things to help them make more money, they arguably understand the time value of time and the money value of time. And all you can do literally is create these value bubbles in the derivative where you will effectively keep non-zero sum value growing, especially if you can combine them. If you guys remember the example before from, from, uh, from Phi's ice cream trucks, just by increasing the amount of value offerings, you can increase the amount of options, or should I say that the, uh, just from increasing the amount of things you, that, that you offer, you create non-zero sum value because you offer new value in the exponential. I hope that makes sense because it's not just physical things that humans value. Like humans will pay money to go to a concert that they'll get blackout drunk at and then completely forget about. Does that make sense to you guys? Like they will in fact exchange money to do this. Millions of people do this every year. They literally take their money, they go buy a concert ticket for probably way more than they should, they go get trashed, they don't remember a goddamn thing, and then they will do it again in a month. Does that make sense? Yes, the value of choice as well. And zero kicks, that's why I call this the threshing floor because we are in fact driving a cow catcher through these concepts of value. Because when you talk about the time value of money, you have to think about the trading of it. You have to think about like making the choice. All six of these are a choice. All six of these are a choice. Does that make sense? Because you can either choose it or you can choose against it. But from it being offered and from it having other things associated with it, you can in fact create non-zero sum value creation. In fact, all of these derivative values will also scale exponentially as you increase your user base. I wonder in PyroSwap's six phase roadmap, how many of these teeth are we going to implement? I wonder, I wonder. Does anyone have any questions about Phi's threshing floor? You probably do. I don't know if I'm gonna keep teaching it for free, money value information and all. But for those of you who don't know, I am planning to effectively launch a economics, tokenomics, and Ponzi-nomics e-course eventually, in which case uh, my design principles, one of which is Phi's threshing floor, is gone into extremely in depth. I don't think I can get into more of it in under an hour, and we're just about running out of time. So I wanna thank everyone for showing up to the PyroSwap show today. If this is your first time, you guys are encouraged to come to our Discord server. Uh, you can learn a lot more about PyroSwap as a project and everything that it offers to its user base. PyroSwap has six different ways of making money just in phase one of its roadmap, which is the phase we're in right now. I don't think a single one of you watching me right now can name a project where there is more than six ways to make money. Six distinct and unique ways to make money. Uh, PyroSwap is not just a crypto project. It is a crypto economy inside the crypto economy. PyroSwap is not su uh, susceptible to the pains of the summer winter cycle like other dApps are. Instead of having summer and winter, it can effectively have big summer and little summer. It is susceptible to the swings of the dollar, but there is so many other derivative values that are capturable within PyroSwap that it is still extremely profitable during uh, downtrend days, or should I say large fear days. Anyways, let's see, do I have any comments here? I'm looking, we've got 120 viewers on Twitter, not bad for a Wednesday. Um, I'll make this announcement quick. We are going to uh, consider variegating the times we do the Pyre Swap show. So uh, for instance, today I did not even play the incantation. Uh, because we do so many shows where I'm not playing the incantation, um, we are going to variegate the times that we do this show. Uh, we're going to increase the variety of content we introduce. So for today, I only taught theoretics on a whiteboard. Um, we might move this, we might move this slot, let's say uh, eight hours into the future on a Wednesday. We might be doing it, um, 
instead of it being, uh, you know, whatever time we started, think about maybe seven hours or eight hours in the future. I haven't determined the exact times yet, but we might variegate some of the times of these shows. Uh, we want to get uh, larger audiences in different time zones and different continents. Um, of course, we do appreciate our North American and European communities. We, uh, we very, very much would like to have all four of our epochs to kind of have a more balanced user base. And uh, we are in fact going to be, we're gonna be streaming soon on a platform called Trovo, which is very big in places like Asia. Yeah, West Asia, North Asia, South Asia, and East Asia. The, the four corners of Asia, uh, it's very popular in Asia. We're gonna be including Trovo streaming to our, uh, to our um, platform package. And um, most importantly, I think that's great for building a community that has, I guess you could say, a variety of value adds, variety of philosophy. And the fact of the matter is, um, since PyroSwap is effectively, PyroSwap and the greater PyroSwap ecosystem effectively introduces new ways of banking, um, I feel like there's a lot of unexplored potential for this in countries that uh, let's say might not have a very sophisticated grasp on banking. Uh, countries that kind of uh, go into economic crisis a little bit too frequently, I think they could benefit a lot from PyroSwap. Um, there is a bit of a learning curve, but I am wholeheartedly committed to uh, bringing hundreds of people across that curve. Anyways, uh, a big shout out again to our sponsor and partner, Pocket. Um, for, for those of you, um, Again, please join our Discord. Uh, there is a, a phenomenal culture inside our Discord. Even on red candle days, our Discord does not get pessimistic and sad. Our Discord is bullish every day because even on red candle days, there are different ways to make money that you're not gonna hear about on crypto Twitter. I'm sorry, but crypto Twitter does not really give you, um, very rarely do I see like solid information uh, displayed on places like crypto Twitter. Most of the time, crypto Twitter looks a lot like what the internet looked like in the 90s. Do you guys remember? Yeah. Do you guys remember? Who here remembers what the internet looked like in the 1990s? Does anyone remember? Who remember? Okay. Maybe no one remembers. Oh, well. Thanks. I remember. Thank you guys so much for tuning into the PyroSwap show. Uh, tomorrow we will be in, this in the same time slot, but possibly next week we'll be uh, revising our schedule. Look for an announcement on that in, our, uh, in the PyroSwap Discord and on Twitter. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow and retweet and uh, come get your free money in the PyroSwap Discord. We're just giving away money. We're crazy like that. Goodbye. <laughs>